Good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Um, as some of you will know, as you just heard there, I'm co-author with my dad of the book, The Future of the Professions. Uh, and I've, I've spoken a lot about the book since its launch a few months ago. Uh, so today I wanted to talk to you about something a little bit different. Um, much, much of the book focuses on the short and the medium term. So today I want to, to look at the longer term. Uh, I plan to take three central themes in our book and ask for each of these themes, if we are right, what's the most important unanswered question that this theme raises? So the long-run story of the book, for those who have read it, is about the decline of the traditional professions. So I'm asking today, what are the questions that after the professions uh, we will need to have an answer to? And I thought this symposium would be a good chance to start exploring some possible answers. So these then are the three central themes from the book. Uh, the first is a transformation in the way that we produce and distribute expertise in society. Uh, the second is a change in the nature and the volume of the work that exists for human beings to do. And the third is a shift in the way that our machines and our systems, what we can call AI for short, operate. And so I'm going to take a look at each of these themes in turn, set out the main question uh, that I think we have to answer. So first, expertise. Now, our book opens with a fundamental question. Why do we have the professions at all? And the answer, and it runs through our book, is because the professions, in analogous ways, are a solution to the same problem. None of us has sufficient specialist knowledge to cope with all our daily challenges. No one can know everything. Human beings have what uh, Herbert Hart called limited understanding, and so we look to doctors, teachers, lawyers, and other professionals because they have the expertise that we need to make progress in life. So in what we call, in the book, a, a print-based industrial society, the professions are the way that we solve these daily challenges. Professionals have knowledge, experience, skills, know-how, uh, and our term for, term for this is they have practical expertise that those they help do not. They operate under a grand bargain, and this arrangement entitles the professions, often to the exclusion of others, to provide certain services, and they're entrusted to act as gatekeepers, each profession responsible for curating and updating their respective bodies of knowledge. So doctors look after medical practical expertise, lawyers look after legal practical expertise, and so on. So that's our analysis of the professions in a print-based industrial society. But we're no longer in a print-based uh, print society. We're moving rapidly, as we've heard today, into a technology-based internet society, and our professions are creaking. You know, they're unaffordable, they're antiquated, they're opaque, and they underperform. And so we ask the question in the book, as we move from a print-based society to an internet society, what are the new ways of organizing professional work? Are there ways to make at least some of this practical expertise available on a different basis? So when we began the book in 2010, our main preoccupation was with the work of the current professions. And however, as our thinking progressed, we concluded that there was a more basic and fundamental question that had to be addressed. Now, how is it that we produce and share practical expertise in society? Now, the traditional answer to this has been through the professions. But what we see at the vanguard and document in the book are very different ways to produce and share practical expertise. And in the book, we set out six alternative models for producing and distributing expertise in society. I'm not going to go into each of them, but what I want to do is just run through very quickly a set of cases that show this very different future emerging. So consider that in the legal world, every year, 60 million disputes arise online, on eBay, and they're resolved without lawyers. They're resolved using what's called an online dispute resolution system. Bear in mind that 60 million disputes is 40 times the number of civil claims that are filed in the entire English and Welsh justice system on this one website. Yeah. Said that the best known legal brand in the US isn't a traditional law firm, it's LegalZoom.com, uh, a provider of automated uh, legal documents and online legal advice. 2014, the US tax authorities received tax returns from almost 48 million Americans using online tax preparation software, either the commercial system like TurboTax or free software provided by the tax authorities without traditional tax professionals. 2014, Associated Press, with the help of the company Automated Insights, started to use algorithms to computerize the production of earnings reports it was able to produce 15 times as many earnings reports 
as it could when it relied upon traditional financial journalists. And in 2011, amidst some controversy, uh, the Vatican, uh, and, and in, in the book, one of the professions that we look at is divinity. Uh, the Vatican granted the first digital imprimatur. And so an imprimatur is the official license uh, that's granted by the Catholic Church to religious texts. It granted it to this app called Confession, uh, which helps people prepare for confession. So this, this app includes tools for tracking sin, and it's got drop-down panels of options for contrition. Uh, and the, the, the controversy was that the Vatican said that uh, so the, the allocation of imprimators is decentralized in the church. So it was a local church somewhere in America that issued the imprimator, and it caused such a storm that the Vatican had to step forward and say, uh, you're allowed to use this app to prepare for confession, but it's no substitute for the real thing. Um, so uh, we, we, we give several hundred, oh, several hundred, we give many examples like this in the book. Uh, and so here is the first question that we think is raised by this, by this theme. Who should own and control tomorrow's practical expertise? You know, traditionally, it was the professions. As I said, the professions were the old gatekeepers. In the past, when you're in need of expert guidance, we turned to them. You know, the, the members of the professions knew things that other people didn't know. The promise of the sort of examples that I just set out before is a liberation of practical expertise, you know, more affordable access to the sort of practical expertise that was traditionally locked up in the heads of professionals or filed away in their cabinets. But what we see is that human experts in the professions are no longer the only source of practical expertise. And in this emerging world where the boundaries of the professions are being redrawn and very different types of people and institutions are creating new sources of practical expertise, that old ground bargain I spoke about before, that arrangement we struck with the professions, starts to make uh, far less sense. So just by way of example, let's return to the example of um, TurboTax, yeah. talking about the decline of the old gatekeepers, one legitimate fear might be the rise of new gatekeepers. So on TurboTax, for example, uh, I think it's about 25 million people use this software alone for, to automate their, uh, their tax returns. Just bear that in mind. Now jump to Brazil. Brazil has a tax system called SPED. So it's eliminated a great deal of self-assessment for Brazilian businesses. Businesses are no longer required to file their tax returns. But what they do instead is they submit their original accounting records electronically to the Brazilian tax authority. And then the Brazilian tax authority calculates, uh, calculates their tax burden rather than the taxpayer, analyzes the data and determines how, much, yeah, determines how much tax to be paid. So in the US, the IRS recently suggested a, a similar thing, not for businesses, but for, uh, for uh, ordinary taxpayers. It's called a return-free tax system. So the software pre-populates the tax return for the taxpayer, and the taxpayer then either okays it or doesn't okay it and, and, and uh, revises it. Now, the IRS claims it takes about four hours to fill in a tax return, so this is quite significant. How did TurboTax respond to this? Well, it's claimed that TurboTax actively lobbied against it. You know, the claim uh, is that Intuit, which is the company responsible for developing TurboTax, spent about $11.5 million on federal lobbying in the five years leading up to 2013, more than Apple or Amazon, against the lobby, uh, and, and it was lobbying against lots of different things, but part of it was opposing IRS government tax preparation. Now, in the statement, the spokesman for, the, uh, for TurboTax said, uh, return-free programs curtail citizen participation in the tax process, also have implications for accuracy and fairness in taxation. That was their response. And it's interesting, by the way, that this piece on TurboTax was written by ProPublica, which is not a traditional uh, news organization at all. And journalism is another one of the professions that we look at that's changing in the book. But just with that in mind, return to the question, who should own and control tomorrow's practical expertise? Who are these new gatekeepers? Who do we want to be the new gatekeepers of anyone? And how do we shape and regulate the sort of behavior that we just saw from TurboTax, if we want to. You know, the old grand bargain that was struck up for the traditional professions doesn't apply to these new gatekeepers. So that's the first question, looking at expertise. Uh, a second theme in the book is then uh, a change in the nature and the volume of work that exists for human beings. Now, the change here, as we write in the book, depends on timescales. Um, in, the, in the medium run, 
our expectation is that, yes, technology would re reduce the number of traditional professional roles, and you already see this happening, but it will give rise to a whole new set of roles. And uh, here's, here's 12 of them. Many of these new roles are unfamiliar when, when, I, when I show them to traditional professionals, and many of these won't be performed by traditional professionals at all. And if you're interested in these, we go through them in the book. Um, but this is the medium term, and in the spirit of today's event, looking to the longer term, it's very different, and that's what I want to focus on now. Uh, one of the difficulties when we think about the long-term consequences of technology on the labor market is that we, talk, we always talk about jobs. Uh, so in the professions, we talk about doctors, we talk about lawyers, we talk about teachers and accountants. Um, but the term job isn't entirely illuminating. A job isn't an indivisible, monolithic lump of work. To think clearly about the future, it's far more helpful to focus on what it is that people actually do in their jobs, you know, the type of tasks that make up their jobs. So by way of example, you know, a nurse, what a nurse does today, the sort of tasks that they do are very different from the sort of tasks they would have done 20 years ago. You know, whereas nursing of the past might have involved bedpans and bedside conversation, you know, today nurses are involved in performing you know, minor operations or prescribing certain types of medication. Very different sets of tasks, but we use the same job title for both. Uh, why does this matter for thinking about the future of work? So when we, when we published the book, The Economist reviewed it, and it was a good review, otherwise I wouldn't have mentioned it. <laughs> and together with the piece was this great illustration of what The Economist called Professor Dr. Robot QC. Um, and there's a sense in a lot of commentary on the future of work the account is that you know, one day a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher will turn up at work and find Professor Dr. Robot QC or one of his relatives you know, sitting in their chair. Their job will have been entirely replaced by some robot. And yet we take a very different view in the book. We, just, we don't think this is how it will play out. Again, by way of example, suppose a new technology is invented that computerizes a particular task uh, that a professional does. So here, a remote monitoring system reduces the need for patients uh, to go to a doctor for a, a medical checkup. Now, clearly, if this technology is introduced, something has changed in the job of a doctor, but to say that the doctor's job has been replaced would be to wildly overstate the case. Um, you know, she, may, she may spend less time performing in-person medical examinations, but she may also spend more time lead, uh, reading the latest uh, medical research. What we want to say is that the job the doctor has done the job the doctor does has changed. Uh, and by thinking about the tasks that make up the job, we can do this far more coherently. So that's why the term job is too general and sweeping, because it masks this deeper underlying churn and change in tasks. So why is this significant? Why does it matter? Uh, well, when we look at the four types of tasks that uh, we think professionals perform in their daily work, you know, there are tasks that require cognitive capabilities, the ability to think, understand, reason, solve problems, reflect. There are tasks that require manual capabilities, so physical and psychomotor aptitude. There are tasks that require affective capability, the capacity to have feelings and emotions, both introspective and in response to others. And then there are tasks that require a moral capability, you know, the faculty to distinguish between right and wrong, good from bad, just from unjust, and so on. And often more than this, to take responsibility for the choice that's made. You know, when you look at those tasks, what you see across all of them is what we call increasingly capable systems that are able to perform more and more types of each of these four categories of tasks. You know, whether it's robotics in the case of manual tasks or uh, in the case of effective tasks, for example, the field of affective computing. Uh, it's a relatively new field where researchers are developing machines that can both detect and respond to human emotions. Um, so across all these different types of tasks, we see increasingly capable systems and machines taking on more and more of them. So leaving aside the question of whether or not there will be less work for people to do, there's a second normative question. You know, might there be some tasks that only human beings should be permitted to undertake? And again, this is different from the technical question whether or not future systems will be able to undertake all tasks to a higher standard than the best human experts. It's a normative question. You know, are there tasks that we feel should always be undertaken by machines even if they could be performed to a higher standard by, uh, sorry, should always be undertaken by human beings, even if they could be performed to a higher standard by machines. 
You know, for example, should a machine make the decision to turn off a life support machine, even if it could reach a more efficient judgment about the allocation of finite resources in a hospital? Should a machine be responsible for passing a life sentence? Now, these are things that I, and I imagine many of you, feel deeply uncomfortable with. Um, now, we see an analogy here with the debate in the UK in the early 1980s over the moral implications of emerging technologies, uh, such as IVF and test tube babies. So at the time, there was a national inquiry and a, a public consultation was launched, and it led to this influential report by the philosopher Mary Warnock. Um, now, the subject at the time generated a lot of attention, and what the inquiry did was it really substantially raised the level of general understanding of the central issues. You know, we suggest in the book that before our systems become much more capable, there's a need for a similar scale of debate on the moral constraints we should impose on the use of models for the production and distribution of practical expertise that do not involve human professionals. Now, there's quite an interesting further complication here, which is that suppose you do hand a task over to machines, you can't escape the moral, uh, the moral dimension. So imagine the, the case of a, a, a driverless car, a Google driverless car, and imagine it finds itself in the following situation. So it's speeding along the road, and out of nowhere, a person appears in the middle of the road. And the car in this situation only has two options. It can either veer off the street, certainly killing the driver, or it can continue to speed on, certainly killing the person in the middle of the street. Now, if, the Googleless driverless, if the Google's driverless car finds itself in that situation today, it has to do something. You know, it has to choose one of those two options. Uh, and you know, to, to an extent, that option has already been chosen. It's articulated in the code that the driverless car follows. <laughs> and it may have been, I, I don't know what the programmer was thinking when he wrote it, uh, but it may have been decided I, uh, you know, intentionally or unintentionally that it would have this sort of consequence. Um, so there's a sort of, there's an, there's an inescapability to some of these moral, moral questions when it comes to automation as well. So now I want to turn to the third and the final theme, uh, AI, and how, and how the nature of it is, is changing. In the 1980s, uh, my dad, who, as I said, I wrote the book with, he was doing his doctorate on artificial intelligence and the law. Um, and looking back on what's happened of the, in the field of AI and talking about it, we've developed an account of the field's development that, that I want to uh, share with you. So my dad was involved in the 1980s in what we now call the first wave of AI. Uh, and he did his doctorate from 1983 to 1986 uh, on artificial intelligence and the law. So very crudely, he was asking, could a judge ever be replaced by a computer? And it was, it was a more you know, abstract question. Looking at the nature of legal reasoning, is it such that this is something that could ever be automated? Uh, and of course, you know, writing in the 80s, the sort of systems and machines that exist today weren't available then, so it was even more of a, um, uh, an abstract question then. Um, so from between 1986 to 1988, he left the academic world and worked on the development of this. Uh, now, my dad, my dad assures me that this at the time was quite cool. It was this cool screen. In fact, it was as cool, cool as it could get. Uh, and, this, and this was a, an expert system. And what happened was this. He had just finished his graduate work in Oxford, and the dean of the law school in Oxford at the time, who was a man called Philip Kappa, had written a book on a very, very complicated area of the law. It was called Latent Damage Law, which is a small corner of the law of limitation. And Philip said that this area of the law was so complicated, nobody understood it. And they had this idea of joining forces to build a system that other people could use in this area. Now, this was an era when floppy disks genuinely were floppy. Uh, and this is, what the, this is what the system looked like. And together, they published a book with these two disks slotted into the back of it. To give you a sense of what they were up against, this was the sort of law. Section two of this act shall not apply to an action to which this section applies. A complicated and difficult stuff. Um, and that was you know, one of the more readily understandable parts of the legislation. Um, so what they tried to do was they tried to develop a pathway through this complicated web of interrelated rules. And frankly, what they did was they developed a sort of decision tree uh, now, it was slightly more complicated than a decision tree because of the, the nature of the content that was involved. 
But typically, a question would look like this. And again, you know, the content doesn't really matter, but from what you've said so far, it seems that the most likely basis for alleging liability will be tortuous negligence. Shall we proceed on this basis, yes or no? Uh, and so you'd answer the question, yes or no, and by answering the questions, you'd be nav navigated through this, this area of law. Um, now, this is just a small part of the tree. Uh, there, I, think, I think there are almost two million paths through the complete tree. And to an extent, the two of them together had to map out this entire thing. Uh, they had to describe each of the paths and, and, and write, the, write the questions. Now, this is, this is the first wave of AI, where what you did, and it was called knowledge acquisition or knowledge elicitation, was that you'd sat down with a human expert, uh, and you'd, you'd mine the jewels of knowledge from their head and try and build it into a system for others to use. You were known as a knowledge engineer. You may recognize knowledge engineering is one of the 12 roles uh, that I set up before. Now, this wasn't just in law. Um, they were developing these expert systems in other fields too, medicine, tax, audit, and consulting. And so that was the model in the 1980s, you know, taking the expertise out of an expert's head, dropping it into some system for non-experts to use. But these systems didn't catch on. And there's lots of reasons why they didn't catch on. Uh, partly, it turned out that the systems were very costly to build and particularly costly to maintain. Because the law changes so rapidly, every time the law changes, you'd have to go back into those two million paths and reconfigure them and rewrite the, rewrite the question. Uh, there was little incentive for commercial organizations to adopt them. Now remember, at the time, most lawyers, uh, and still, you know, most lawyers charge by the hour. There's no incentive to develop sort of technology that could take a task that might have required four days and turn it into one that you know, takes four minutes. Um, and you know, finally, the web came along. And this wasn't, you know, the web wasn't the same sort of thing that the AI researchers at the time were, you know, were aspiring to do. But what it did was it offered a really intuitive way to make content and guidance available online very quickly, very cheaply. Um, and so the AI winter, as it's called, the failure, the initial failure of these first wave of uh, expert systems, at least in the professions, um, we attribute to the web. Um, not, because, not because it was that people were, were distracted, but because they were attracted to this new way of making expertise available. It was just far more, it was far easier to build a website and, and put up some legal advice online than it was to build these incredibly complicated expert systems. Now, a turning point came in 1997, when Gary Kasparov, who was the then world chess champion and is well known, uh, was defeated by Deep Blue. In the 1980s, when AI researchers were working in the computer labs, and they talked about this sort of thing. Chess playing was one of the areas in which they were particularly interested. And my dad and his colleagues, for example, were convinced that a computer system could never beat a grandmaster like Gary Kasparov. And the reason why they thought this is incredibly important. The problem with human experts, uh, and in Gary Kasparov is a great example. He's an expert at playing chess is that they don't, taking the case of Gary Kasparov, he doesn't really know how it is that he plays Grandmaster Chess. He struggles to articulate it. And when you press a Grandmaster, they appeal to things like gut reaction, heuristics, ex accumulated experience, and so on. And these things are very difficult to articulate. They're very difficult to model. And so if you can't get a system or machine, if you can't articulate these things in a set of rules for a system and machine, to follow, then, assist, and then the task can't be automated. And that, in, in the case of uh, playing Grandmaster Chess, uh, that's exactly what was happening. These chess players couldn't articulate how it was they were so good, and as a result, you couldn't build a system that could uh, perform as well as them. Now, what these, you know, what my dad and his colleagues hadn't banked on was the exponential growth and processing power that we've, we've heard about. And by the time Gary Kasparov played Deep Blue, Deep Blue could consider up to 330 million moves a second. And Gary Kasparov could consider about 100 moves a go. You know, in a sense, Gary Kasparov was beaten by a machine that was just playing a completely different game. He was blown out of the water by brute force processing power. It wasn't that the system had more genius than him. It wasn't that it had greater strategic insight. It was raw processing power. Now, the insight 
here, and it's made by Patrick Winston, one of the leading researchers in artificial intelligence, is this. You know, there are lots of ways of being smart that aren't smart like us. And this is a vital point. You know, we tend to be incredibly anthropocentric, human-orientated, when we think about machines and getting them to perform at a higher standard. We tend to assume, um, well, it, it leads to this, which is, in some ways, one of the most important ideas in the book, the, the AI fallacy. And it's this, which is the mistaken assumption that the only way to develop systems that perform tasks at the level of, hu uh, of human experts or higher is to try and replicate the thinking processes of human specialists. And it's made by uh, academics, and it's made by commentators, and it's simply mistaken. You know, many of the systems and machines that are displacing professionals, displacing middle-class workers from performing tasks, are doing so by for performing that task in a very, very different way from a human being. And this AI fallacy, this mistaken assumption, I think is you know, the source of a great deal of conservatism in thinking about the longer-term prospects of labor. The temp all of our temptations is to say, you know, since a computer can't think, it can't ever be creative. Because a computer can't feel, it can't ever be empathetic. And so it must be that tasks that require creativity or tasks that require empathy must always be performed by a human being, and so on. And the mistake is to fail to notice that many of these new systems can perform these tasks, not by copying the way that human beings do it with either creativity or empathy, but doing it in an entirely different, often in an unhuman way. It really leads to a related question, can machines think? Um, you know, we love this question philosophically, but we also love the answer that John Searle, a great philosopher, put uh, forward in a, a Wall Street Journal op-ed the day after Watson beat uh, the two leading Jeopardy. So who, who knows about the story of Watson and beating the, ra raise, a, raise a hand. Okay, so Watson was a supercomputer that beat, played the two leading uh, Jeopardy champions. Jeopardy is an American quiz show uh, in 2011, and it beat them both. You know, in effect, this was a machine that was able to answer a question about anything in the world better than the two leading human experts. Now, what John Searle said the day after it did this was, Watson doesn't know it won on Jeopardy. No, Watson didn't go down to the pub to celebrate with his friends. Um, it didn't tell its friends how it felt, that it was overjoyed, but it still outperformed the two leading experts. And this is vital. You know, what we're seeing is the emergence of increasingly capable, non-thinking machines. They're not like us. They're not like professionals. They're not like middle-class workers. But they're outperforming us at certain types of tasks that we thought could only be performed by human beings. And this we call the second wave of AI. And it has profound implications for the future of work, not just professional work. As I said, I think this AI fallacy is the source of a lot of conservatism about what it is that machines might be capable of doing in the future. But it also leads to a third question. How is it we can understand the reasoning of second wave AI? When we hold professionals responsible and hold them to account, we almost certainly ask them for an explanation for how they came to their conclusions and why they made their decisions. You know, why doctor did you make that diagnosis? Why lawyer do you advise not going forward with this case and so on? How are we to secure explanations from these high performing machines when they work in ways that are quite unlike the reasoning process of human beings? So just to return to the system, the system that was developed in the 80s, you know, one characteristic of expert systems then was that the system should be transparent. That was the, the term of art, which meant that they, they could explain their, their lines of reasoning. Um, so Philip, Philip Kappa, who, who this uh, system, whose expertise the system was modeled on, um, tells stories of the, the, the system reaching a conclusion that he didn't immediately agree with. He said, no, the system must have got this wrong. This can't be right. And, and then what he'd do is he'd go and look through, the, look through the decision tree that that machine had gone through, and he'd be able to see exactly how it got to the decision it got to. You know, it could follow the path through this tree. It's not clear that second wave AI systems will be able to explain themselves in this way, you know, as it were, um, as the first wave AI researchers had hoped. It's not clear that these new systems will be transparent in the same way. Yeah. Having said all that, it's, you know, it's also important to be clear that many of our high-performing experts, for the reason I explained before, are unable to explain the work that they do. 
uh, again, you know, doctors who put down a diagnosis to gut reaction or experience are struggling to articulate precisely the reasoning processes that they go through. Um, but just, just to, to close with an example of this, Lex Machina, it's a, a system that was bought very recently by, by LexisNexis. Um, it's, a, it's a system that predicts the outcome of patent disputes, which is incredibly important if you're wanting, if you're a lawyer and wanting to know the potential outcome of a case, whether or not to go forward with it, how much resource to put into it, and so on. This system can more accurately predict the outcome of a patent dispute than the leading human patent lawyers. Now, the most important thing, again here, it knows absolutely nothing about the law. You know, the, the way it reaches this decision is by trawling through a data set of about 100,000 past cases where the judge involved in the case, the nature of the case, the location of the case, the people who are on either side and so on, all these things are data points. And it is able to reach a more accurate prediction than leading human experts. I went back to the, the research paper where this was, um, where this was first set out. It's very difficult to interpret the reasoning, unless you know quite a lot of complicated statistics, it's very, very difficult to interpret the reasoning process that the system is going through in order to reach a probabilistic estimate. It's a set of very complicated regressions. Now, it might not be, uh, that lack of transparency might not worry people in the case of predicting a patent dispute, but it might worry you if it's a, a system that is uh, predicting, given a set of symptoms, whether or not you have a certain type of cancer, or um, whether or not, again, you know, whether or not you ought to spend the rest of your life in jail. If these systems aren't transparent and we can't understand the reasoning process that they're going through to reach really important decisions, then that, that might be problematic. So again, this question of how we can understand the reasoning of these second wave AI systems, which are very, very different from the first wave, uh, first wave of AI in the 1980s, I think is, is, a, is an important question. So to close then, from the book, three central themes, one, a change in the nature of the production and distribution of expertise in society, and that raises the question, who should own and control tomorrow's practical expertise? Secondly, a change in the nature and the volume of work that exists for human beings. And here, an important question is, are there certain tasks that ought not to be performed by machines, even if they could be performed to a higher standard? And thirdly, the shift in the, in the way in which our systems are operating from first wave AI to second wave AI now, how is it we can understand the reasoning processes of this second wave of AI, and is it something that matters to us? Um, so I'll, I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. Comments, questions? Okay, I'll have to go there. Um, I, th I think the, the question about... Um, Transparency of reasoning hmm. might be one of the might be one of the really big um, uh, obstacles to deploying this stuff in lots of areas, mm -hmm. um, and it's not just in medical areas. We see them all, all over the place, um, and um, it, it sort of stands in the way of the triumphalism of the um, evangelists for this stuff hmm. at the moment because they seem to be unconcerned about about things like lack of transparency? So, so two responses. The first, the first is both the takes on the same. Uh, so it's one response with two elements. Uh, what's the benchmark here? You know, what is it that we're comparing these new systems to? As I said, in, in the medical case, if you were to ask a doctor how it is that they reach a particular type of diagnosis and really try and pin them down on it, often uh, the reasons that they give are not at all comprehensible. Uh, it's things like, I've just studied this stuff and I know it when I see it. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't strike me as a particularly transparent, um, it, we, sh we shouldn't, in other words, hold these systems to a higher standard than we hold fellow human beings. We shouldn't expect perfect lucidity of reasoning when we don't expect that from human beings. So just, we've got, we've got to be careful that we don't, and you see, you see this very often, not only in terms of transparency, but also in terms of the outcomes that these systems and machines are able to achieve. 
And there's a, a robot pharmacist at the University of California uh, in San Francisco. And um, it's made 6 million prescriptions without error. In fact, sorry, it's made 6 million prescriptions and it's made one error. Now, a lot of people, when they see that error, um, get incredibly angry. Yeah, it's, this could have killed someone. So. Um, but you've also got to bear in mind that at best, human beings make an error in prescribing medication 1% of the time. Now, 1% of 6 million prescriptions is 60,000 misprescriptions. You know, to, to shut down this machine because it made one misprescription would be to hold it to a wildly higher standard than we hold uh, our fellow human beings. So that, that's the first point. I mean, the, the second point is a more general thing, which is you know, the promise of a lot of these systems that they, is that they offer access to expertise that for most people at the moment is you know, unaffordable. Yeah. And it's, and it's, in the legal case, those 60 million disputes that were resolved online on eBay, those are disputes that without that system would have probably gone unresolved, or if, if resolved, resolved unsatisfactorily for one of the parties. Um, now, it may be that the system that has reached that judgment is less transparent than the leading barrister uh, would have been if he was brought into that judgment. Um, but again, the benchmark for, these, for the people who are using the system is nothing at all. You know, it's, it's no access to legal expertise. And so we just, ha I, I, th I think the, yeah. well, I, I recognize this as a big problem, and it's a big problem in particularly significant areas. Um, we ought not to, uh, I, I don't think it's, but um, we, 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 yeah. yeah. You, Should that, I mean, I'm just thinking that, doesn't that also apply to, say, the, exam the hypothetical example you, you raised earlier on about the, the Google car having to make a decision between swerving off the road or killing, mm. killing, killing the pedestrian yeah. um, because human drivers confronted with that dilemma don't don't sit around they don't stop and think well what exactly would be the optimum no. outcome here they, no. yeah so you, you, you can't hold in that sense you, it's unrealistic to hold the machine to, to a higher standard than you would I, I, I think that's a really troubling line of reasoning I think it's you know we are being forced in writing code in this way if we're trying to build in possible scenarios all possible scenarios we're yeah. forced to make moral calculations in a kind of deliberative way that we simply aren't forced, you know, that in ordinary life we would make in a far more um, instinctive, yep. um, uh, yeah. You, uh, and is it not also, is it the case that, say, in some areas of, for example, uh, paralegal professional yeah. work, um, that, that already um, law firms use uh, software to do, for example, in, in discovery cases. Of course, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If, if you look and at... Do it more accurately than humans. Yeah, if, if you look at what it is that a junior lawyer does in the first few years of their career, things like reviewing documents, assembling documents, and retrieving documents, you know, reviewing large documents for typos, mm. assembling documents that ultimately are very similar to the document they assembled the day before, but with a couple of things tweaked, and... Thirdly, retrieving documents from vast bodies of documents. Now, those are the sorts of things that systems and machines are incredibly effective at performing. And, and you see law firms already using these, these systems. But it then introduces a problem of you know, if the first 10 years of your career as a legal professional has been automated, and the stuff that hasn't been automated is at the other end of the, yeah. your career, how, how do you get there? How do you train to... Um, yeah, sure. No, all, I can see that, all, but, yeah. but doesn't I mean in a way that means that in some areas the 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 future that 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 people who, who are thinking about this stuff think yeah. is is some distance away. It's it's already here in the, in an area like that, and maybe mm. in others. And 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 if I had time, I would have gone through many more cases right. where you see this. This isn't this isn't fanciful. You know, we we talk about the talk in the book about the decline of the traditional professions, and it's already happening. You know, whatever profession you look at, whether it's journalism, consulting, tax, auditing, audit, auditing yeah. Yeah. Uh, law, education, healthcare. You see things that tradition, you see tasks that were you know, performed re basically in the same way since the middle of the 19th century by a similar group of people being done by very different people yeah. or done not by people at all uh, and by very different types of institutions. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So 
two reasons why um, a company might be interested in automation would be either to replace an employee or to make an employee's job more efficient. And certainly in blue collar work, uh, it seems that the trend has been towards replacement, right? You have self checkout machines, so you don't have to hire as many um, people running the, the checkout counter. Um, but you seem to have suggested that at least in some areas of white collar work, um, with your doctor example, it's not that the doctor is replaced. Um, you seem to have suggested that certain tasks will be automated, but other tasks will will take their place. And I wonder, um, so I wonder if you think that is, first, am I interpreting you correctly that white collar, are you saying that white collar jobs are not apt to be replaced in the same way that blue collar jobs have been? And if that's not what you're saying, do you, do you see a difference? Sure. So it's, um, if, if, I, if I had more time, I would have gone into exactly the mechanics of what I think is happening in the labor market and will happen. Um, what you've drawn there is a distinction between technology that complements people, human beings in performing tasks, uh, and technologies that substitute for people in performing particular tasks. Uh, and you know, largely what people disagree about when they talk about the future of work is whether or not technology is something that substitutes or complements for, for workers. Um, Part of the problem with that story is that it's not a task-based story. You know, the question is, why is it that technologies complement particular types of factors in performing? You know, why is it that, so if you, if you read the economics literature, uh, the story that's told about the labor market in the second half of the 20th century is skills biased technological change. The technological change is skills biased. Uh, it has for certain periods in the US raised the skills premium, which is the premium, kind of the, the extra wage that you get from having a college education. So the question is why, why is that? Why, and it's only by thinking about tasks that you can really think coherently about why it is that technology might be, might complement particular factors and not complement other factors. So it might, to talk about the white collar and blue collar, why is it that technology might complement white collar workers but substitute for blue collar workers? It's because it's, complementing the sort of tasks that it is that white collar workers do and it's substitute. Now, the argument we make in the book is that while it may be the case that certain technologies complement um, people today in performing certain types of tasks, there's no reason to think, you know, there's no economic law that says when we create new tasks for people to do in the future that necessarily those are the sort of tasks that will be done by human beings. Um, and yeah, on the contrary, when you see what it is that technology is capable of doing across all these different categories of tasks, it's able to perform more and more tasks. Yeah, it seems to us that it becomes more and more likely that tasks that are created in the future will be done by people rather than by machines. So um, that's a sort of a long, a long response there. Thank you very much for that. It's absolutely fascinating, but I'd like to raise with you a problem mm. that I think you didn't touch on. Uh, it's what I call human knowledge, and everybody in this room knows what I'm talking about. You get a call from your mother, and you know she's annoyed with you, but you don't know why. Yeah. You walk into a room, and there's been a row, and you can tell it. You meet somebody, and you think, I don't like that person. Yeah. That person is not honest. She's not telling me the truth. All that stuff. It's absolutely essential to being human. Yes. And everything that you talk about, which I think is extremely clear and right, and I'm sure is going to happen in one form or another, excludes that essential element yeah. of human knowledge without which we can't live. And I'm a very old man, and it scares the hell out of me. Yeah. Because nothing, I mean, uh, we, we were asked to sign up by a, a mechanized system for this, this conference. Why? It's not that there are... Uh, rooms, you know, it's, it, because it's there, it's used. Yeah. And it took me a hell of a lot more time than it would have done if I just simply showed up and said, is there space? So I don't know what's going to happen to human knowledge, yeah. but I don't know that we could live without it. Okay, so, it is, so it's a really interesting... So the claim you're making is that uh, there are certain types of knowledge, expertise, wisdom, whatever you want to call it, that are unique to human beings that can't be... That can't be replicated by machines. 
um, it may well be true that there are certain types of you know, wisdom that can only be embodied in a person. That's fine. Um, it may be that, that the question that I'm interested in is when you look at the sort of problems that human beings bring that human knowledge to bear on, might there be different ways to solve those problems that don't require that human, that kind of distinctly human expertise? Now, it's to, let me put it another way, you're at risk of committing the AI fallacy in thinking that the only way to solve the problems that exist in the world are by drawing on this source, this fount of human wisdom. Uh, and that if a machine can't replicate this human wisdom, then there's no way to solve the problems that that human wisdom solves. And, and, and just, just very quick, and what we're arguing in the book is you've got to move away from the kind of anthropocentric view that because we've solved problems in the past by drawing on these particular types of intrinsically human wisdom, we'll necessarily need to draw on that in the future, and if machines can't copy it, then you know, there, will be, there are very, very different ways of solving you know, let, let, me, let, me give you, let me give you an example. There are now systems and machines that can more accurately than a human being uh, tell whether or not a smile on a human being's face is a genuine smile or just a smile of social conformity. You know, it's not, it's not making that distinction based on the sort of, you know, I'd argue, sort of human, uh, we can call it tacit knowledge, we can call it wisdom, we can call it whatever. It's doing it by trawling tens of thousands of past cases of faces that the person whose face it is said that I'm expressing genuine uh, elation and others who said I'm just trying to fit in. Um, so, please. And, 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 and let... And let, and let Of course, those 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 aren't the, so absolutely. But those aren't the stock and trade of the professions. The role of the professions is to solve some of the most important problems in society. You know, how do we educate our children? How do we resolve legal problems? You know, it's not the it's not the it's not the purpose of ill health to provide a living for a doctor. You know, it's not the purpose of the law to provide a living for lawyers. And if we can find more effective ways of resolving these problems, uh, problems that for most people in society go unresolved. Uh, and if those, the way we resolve the pro those problems doesn't involve human beings, we should embrace them. And it's a, mis it's a mistake, I think, to, to um, let, me, let me put it an another way. That, uh, the sort of things you, you describe that you're, you're valuing, uh, you know, things like love, things like human, those don't need to happen in a doctor's room. You know, it's, not, it's not the purpose of the professions to provide comfortable personal interaction. I, hang, I'm, just, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to do this. The, the expression on my face is genuinely regretful <laughs> and could be established by machines if need be. We, we, we have one more speaker to go, so we'll have to, we'll have to pass that. Dan, thank you very much. Yeah. Let's move, let's not move at all. On. Thank you very much.